Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. So today we are wrapping up a sermon series that we have called Six Stories That Change the World. And I thought I would end by sharing a story with you. You see, several thousand years ago, there was a man, a Jewish man, who decided that he was gonna go on a trip. He was gonna travel from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, at this point in time, when someone decides they're gonna travel from one city to the next or one town to the next, it's a little bit different than when you or I decide we're gonna travel. And so when he made this decision that he was going to take this trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, he began to think through all of the things that he would need to carry with him, the possessions he would need to take, the valuables that he certainly didn't want to leave behind, the money that he would need to have with him to purchase the things when he arrived to Jericho. He would need to think about what time of the day to leave. I would imagine he would leave early in the morning before the sun came up so that he would spend less time traveling in the intense heat of the day, kind of like what you experienced on your way in this morning. He would even be thinking through the potential risk involved with this 17-mile walk that he was going to take. The risk of bandits, robbers, uh, people with ill intentions that could potentially surprise him along the way and try to take from him what he brought on his person. And so the man starts out early in the morning before the sun has even come up and he's got all of his things with him and his mind is wandering and he's thinking through what's gonna happen when he arrives at his destination. And all of a sudden, while he's walking, he gets this sense of dis-ease. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, you don't hear something, you haven't seen something, but there's just something in your body that tells you that something's not right. There's an instinct, an intuition, and all of a sudden the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you, you find yourself feeling that fight or flight or freeze stress response hit your body and this Jewish man is now on high alert. And for good reason because all of a sudden he's faced with a group of bandits, robbers, who have come to completely ruin his trip. Now, this Jewish man understands we wouldn't get this because we're not a first century individual, but he understands that according to custom, all he has to do is relinquish whatever the bandits want and they won't harm him. They won't physically harm him. He just has to give them whatever it is they're wanting that he has on his person. He has to cooperate with the bandits. He's faced with this choice in the moment. And I don't know why he does what he does. And I'm not gonna judge him because if I were in this situation, I don't know what I would do. But he does not give them willingly what they are asking him for. And so before he even realizes what happens, the bandits beat him they take all of his possessions and they leave him without his clothing. This man is now on the side of the road. He's unconscious. He's bleeding. His eyes are swollen shut. He's having a hard time breathing. Can't move his body. Can't cry out for help. It's a pretty hopeless situation. And so as he lays there, he begins to panic. And he can't panic out loud by yelling for help. He can't panic by trying to move himself to a more comfortable position. He's just panicking internally. And he's thinking, the only hope that I have right now is that maybe, maybe, just maybe, another Jewish law-abiding person is going to come by 
and help me. And so he lays there, and I don't know how long he lays there for. It could have been an hour. It could have been five hours. It could have been five minutes, but he lays there. And all of a sudden, he begins to hear the faint sound of hooves. And he begins to hope that it's good guys coming and not more bandits, even though he has nothing left for them to take. Hooves are coming, hooves are coming, hooves are coming. And as they get closer, he can't open his eyes, so he can't see. Is this a Jewish person? Are they dressed the way that a Jewish person would dress? Because a Jewish person is gonna be my friend. He can't see, but he can hear the hooves. And as they get closer, he can hear them speaking. And so he knows right away because of their language and their dialect that this, this is, these are Jewish people. And not only are they a Jewish people, but it's a Jewish priest, a Jewish priest that's on his way from Jerusalem back home to Jericho. And the man thinks, this is the best news ever. I might actually be okay. And as the hooves get closer and the voices get closer, he thinks, I might just make it. But much to his disappointment, the voices and the hooves just keep going and they pass him by. And no matter what he does, he can't find his voice and he can't move his body to try to get their attention. And he realizes the priest must think I'm dead because surely he wouldn't walk by and not help me if he knew I was alive. He must not know that I'm another fellow Jewish person and that was my chance. And then some time passes and all of a sudden he hears the sound of more hooves. It's a little harder to hope this time that there might be some help that comes along the way. And he doesn't know who it is. He still can't open his eyes. He still can't move his body. He's trying to find his voice, but it's just not there. And as the hooves get closer, he hears more voices and he realizes that this is the Levite who's following the priest from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he thinks, maybe, maybe the Levite will do what, what the priest didn't do and, and, and they'll at least stop and, and, and check on me and, and see that, that I'm breathing and, and I'm alive and I need help. But the hooves and the voices, they just keep going. And more time passes and it's getting harder to breathe, harder to stay conscious in his mind and awake. And all of a sudden, he hears more hooves, but just a single set this time, not several. And instead of feeling hope, there's a bit of panic. Like, who, who's traveling alone on the road this time? And, and maybe they'll help, but maybe they won't. Is it a good guy? Is it a bad guy? I, I don't know at this point. But there's no voices, there's only one set of hooves, and as they get closer, they don't keep going. They stop. And then he hears an individual climb off the animal onto the road and begin to walk over to where he's laying. And there's this mixture of hope and panic and hope and panic and I don't know what's gonna happen. Is this a good guy? Is this a bad guy? I don't know. I can't open my eyes. I'm not hearing a voice to understand language or dialect. There's no context. And the individual kneels down next to the man and begins to speak to him. And all of a sudden, the Jewish man panics. His heart races faster than he thought it possibly could. And he's doing everything he can to escape in this moment because what he understands the minute the individual spoke to him is that this is a Samaritan man. This is the worst possible scenario the man could imagine because you see, Jews and Samaritans hate one another. And the man's laying there thinking, as soon as this Samaritan understands that I am a, a Jewish person, they're gonna end it. It's gonna be over. What, what breath I have left in my lungs is, is gonna be done. But, but he's shocked when, when the, the man says, you're gonna be okay. Don't, don't worry. And the man goes back to the animal and, and he's gone for just a, a few seconds and then he comes back and the man laying there realizes the man has gotten wine and oil and bandages and the Samaritan man begins to disinfect and 
treat and close his wounds. And the Jewish man is laying there thinking, this, this can't possibly be happening. And then the Samaritan man says to him, okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick you up and I'm gonna put you over the back of my animal and we're gonna get you somewhere safe. And if the Jewish man had his voice, if he could use his body, he would say, no, 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 no. Don't take me anywhere because there's no way you could be taking me somewhere safe. There's no way you could be doing good to me. And so they travel the rest of the way to Jericho. And when they get there, the Jewish man is still hurt and wounded. He can't talk, he can't move. And he's thinking, oh, what is even gonna happen? And he overhears the Samaritan man speaking with an innkeeper. And the Samaritan man says, please look after this individual. Take care of them, meet their needs. And here's enough to cover his stay for two weeks. And if for some reason, I don't make it back within two weeks, I will come back and I will cover the rest of his day. And the Jewish man is just like, floored and blown away because he knew the minute that Samaritan man rode into Jericho with a wounded and dying Jewish man on the back of his animal, the whole community would have come out to take vengeance. It's boggling that that didn't happen. The Samaritan man took this huge risk and then he understood that when they got to the inn, the generosity of the Samaritan man to say, I'm gonna not only pay for at least two weeks, but I'll pay for whatever his stay is, was mind boggling again because the Jewish man understood that according to culture, if you're at an inn and you can't cover the cost of your stay and there was no way he was gonna cover the cost of his own stay, well, all of a sudden you find yourself enslaved to that business owner. And this is how the story ends. We don't know what happens to the Jewish man we don't know what happens to the Samaritan. We don't know how long it took for the Jewish man to recover. But this story is a story that Jesus told in response to two questions. Two questions that people were asking in the first century. Two questions that you and I continue to ask today that change our lives. The first question is what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is what the religious leader came to ask Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when we see and, and listen and read this, um, and kind of at its surface level, we, we think automatically sometimes about life after death and how to keep living forever. What must I do in order to never die? And that's a piece of it. But I think the question that you and I are also asking, maybe even more often, is what does it mean to really live? The original Greek of that word life is fullness of life. It's a rich life. It's a satisfying life. It's filled with goodness and blessing. It's uh, when Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and life to the full, this is what they're asking about. It's not only never ending eternal life, but life here and now. How, what do I do to inherit that kind of life? And then the second question most of us are familiar with, if you know the story, is, well, who's my neighbor? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? You see, Jesus responded and said, you know, well, what, is, what does it say in the law? And the religious leader says, well, love God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, what else do you need? And the religious leader comes back, he goes, okay, well, can we talk about that neighbor part? Who is that? And I think, we're asking that question too. When we think of the, the, the lofty 
goal of loving our neighbor as ourself. Well, who is our neighbor? Is it the person that is consistently opposed to the thing that we hold near and dear to our heart? Is it the person with the sign or the flag yelling and screaming something that just makes us cringe? Is it the person that when we spend time with them, no matter whether it's five minutes or five hours, they just over and over again are saying things that offend us and hurt our feelings? Is it the person that chews too loud? You laugh, but in our house, that's been like the number one dinner time argument for two years running. Um, evidently, we have loud chewers in our house. And three out of seven nights a week, someone is yelling at someone else at the table to stop chewing so loud. Is it just us? We want to know, like, who is, who is our neighbor? And so Luke chapter 10 kind of finishes the dialogue for us between Jesus and the religious leader, helps us to understand how the story was set up and, and how it wraps up. So one day, an expert in religious law stood up. He's testing Jesus. This was not like a curious, humble question. He's really trying to test and trap Jesus here. And he asks him this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. Well, the man wanted to justify his actions. And so he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? So what we see here in the story and in this interaction between Jesus and the religious leader is that Jesus is a masterful teacher. Have you ever noticed that about Jesus in the gospels before? He is a masterful teacher. More often than not, when someone asks Jesus a question, he responds with another question. And so what's happening here in this dialogue is Jesus is helping the man to see that he's actually asking the wrong questions. And he's helping the man to see here, there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. So what's happening is as Jesus tells the story and they, they look together at what this means, they, they're building this skyscraper that none of us could ever jump over or climb over or get over. That's what, that's what the law does. It's this just impossible thing. And, and Jesus is wanting him to see there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. It's a gift. It's grace. It's freely given. It's already yours. It's already ours. And so he turns the questions around. When you read through the story of the Good Samaritan or you listen to it, what, what you may not have considered because I hadn't considered this before is that the Good Samaritan in the story is a symbol for Jesus. Many of the early theologians um, came to this conclusion. And so it's not that we have to do everything that the Good Samaritan did with all of perfection because that's the impossible skyscraper that Jesus is building. Jesus has already done it. We accept it and we trust it and then we live in imitation with grace. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, don't, un, don't misunderstand why I've come. I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. He's saying to this religious leader, you're asking the wrong question. There's nothing you can do. It's already been done. It's already yours by grace. Our part is to learn to trust and to surrender and to accept what's already been given to us as heirs in Christ. Um, Richard Rohr 
has written a couple of my favorite books, and I find myself sometimes returning to them in different seasons. And one of them, he writes about um, contemplative prayer, which is a way of learning to see the kingdom of God, uh, the presence of God in us and in one another and all around us. It's this way of learning to notice and pay attention to and enjoy um, God's goodness all around us all the time. That's the best way I can sum it up. And as I was reading through this week, I read a quote that I'm gonna read to you because I thought, this is what we're talking about this week. And he says it better than I could ever imagine trying to say it myself. This is what he says. He says, the great commandment is not thou shall be right. The great commandment is to be in love. Be inside the great compassion, the great stream, the great river. Remember when Jesus was with the woman at the well and he talked about the rivers of living water. That's what Richard is writing about here. As others have rightly said, all that is needed is surrender and gratitude. Surrender and gratitude. Surrender and gratitude for this grace that's already ours. And so some of my own um, journey the last several years has been learning to invite God to help move some of these theological concepts from my head um, into my heart and into my lived experience. And one of the ways that I'm learning to do that is to uh, look to um, nature and art and relationships and just everyday moments uh, for holy surprises, to just be in awe and in delight of God already in us and around us and with us. And it's like two steps forward and five steps back <laughs> because what I did last week was I tried to orchestrate this for myself, which is the opposite of a holy surprise, right? So um, what I saw in May was this uh, really cool thing called an outdoor orchestra that was taking place in La Jolla last week. And for tickets that were about the cost of a movie ticket, I could take our whole family and we could go listen to Mozart, played by some of the most incredible musicians from around the country. Now, I've never been to an orchestra, but online it said it was family friendly and it's in an outdoor park, and they're selling food. And so I think this is, just sounds perfect. I'm gonna bring Ryan, and I have two teenagers, and I have an eight-year-old, and it's an hour and a half, and it's gonna be this awe-inspiring encounter and experience. And we get there, all the things are going smoothly, and we are in these concrete bleachers, okay? And they have these blue, uh, stadium seats they've set out so that you have kind of a padded seat with a seat back, which was really thoughtful of them. So we were sitting there, we're getting everybody settled, we have our blankets and our snacks and our things, and it starts. No one told me that they're quiet. Did you know that the orchestra is quiet? Am I the, like, you could hear somebody drop a penny on the floor. It's the most gorgeous instrumental music happening. The most talented piano player, like with no music. And within 10 seconds, all you could hear was shh. Every time Abby decided she needed to move, which was about every 10 seconds. <laughs> so I start panicking trying to figure out like what to do um, because there's no way I'm expecting this cute, adorable, high energy eight-year-old to stay still the whole hour and a half. And so I won't, I won't tell you the rest of the, the story and how we handled it. But for me, what I realized was surrender and gratitude is really not found in the moments that we're trying to orchestrate, literally, pun intended, this experience for ourselves. It was more for me a lesson of patience and humility and like not getting things the way that I wanted them. But I'm finding that this is moving from my head to my heart when I notice the smell of jasmine this time of the year, when I notice the way the light sometimes moves through the trees, 
When one of my precious kids just happens to holler out from another part of the house, I love you, mom. When we sit down over a meal with our people, our friends, our community, and we share stories and griefs and disappointments and healing and hope, there are these glimmers and these glimpses where I see we're living in this eternal life now. I can't orchestrate it. I can't make it happen. I can't plan it. But sometimes by the grace of God, it surprises me. And I can surrender to that and I can be grateful for that when I notice it. And then the question shifts. The question isn't who is my neighbor? We noticed this before. The question becomes, how do I become a neighbor? How do I become a neighbor? Or a better word may be, how do I become a friend? That word neighbor could be translated friend. Jesus is subtly saying, you're asking the wrong question again. It's not about who, who is your friend. It's how do you become a friend? to the one you encounter that is in need. Luke 10, Jesus says at the end of the story, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, now go and do the same. When you encounter someone in need, show them mercy. And mercy is this kind of small but big word that really just means kindness or goodwill towards someone who is hurting, towards someone who's miserable, who, who's experienced some kind of affliction, and it's joined with a desire to help them. And it doesn't come with any qualifications that they are supposed to be something or do something or have something, there, there are no qualifications there. And so as we consider this story of the Good Samaritan, one of the, the questions that I naturally begin to ask is, what are some of the things I see in the story that I can relate to that, that sometimes sabotage my ability or my willingness to become a friend, to become a neighbor when I encounter someone who's in need. And the reality is I can relate to the priest and the Levite in the story more than I would like to admit sometimes. You see, the priest, I think, reveals a lot about human nature, but one of the things that we see is the priest reveals our preoccupation with efficiency this need to just get things done according to our timeline and according to our goals and according to our agenda. And I can, I can so relate to this. It's hard for me when there are interruptions. It's hard for me when someone messes with my plans. It's hard for me when I have a list of all the things that I need to get done and get accomplished and all of a sudden that just gets sideswiped. One of the reasons Scholars think the priest didn't stop along the way was because the priest went through a whole list of how inconvenient and time intensive it would be to stop. And then we see the Levite who reveals our preoccupation with, I think, what, what others think of us. You see, the Levite would have known the priest didn't stop and the Levite would have been thinking, well, if he, he didn't stop, but I stop, it's gonna be really awkward when we get back to Jericho. That could cause some tension in our working relationship. You see, the Levite was the subordinate to the priest. And maybe it wasn't that, maybe it was simply that sometimes, um, it's easier and simpler to just let someone in a place of authority do the thinking and make the decisions for us. And so we just kind of blindly follow. Maybe that was a part of it, but this preoccupation with what others are thinking. 
But the Samaritan, the Samaritan becomes a neighbor, becomes a friend in spite of interruption, in spite of the inconvenience, even in spite of misunderstanding and the risk of death. And so we are called to follow the example of Jesus. And it's a lofty example. It's a skyscraper of an example. And so there's no expectation that we do it right or we get it perfect because that's just not even an option, but by the grace of God, we can follow Jesus and discern with God what this looks like in our stories and in our communities and in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. And so some questions I wanna leave us with today before we close in a prayer together. What does it look like for us to become a neighbor this week that loves even when it's an interruption, even when it's an inconvenience, even if there may be some misunderstanding, even if there may be some risk? I mean, we're not risking death probably, but there's social risk, there's relational risk, there's like, what am I gonna look like? There's just risk. What does it look like for us to become a friend even with some of those things at play. Another question that may be helpful is, does one of those specifically leave you more unsettled than the others? When you hear it, you kind of go, oh, I don't know about that one. An invitation may be not to feel guilty about that. Know that there's no condemnation around that. That may just be a signal or an invitation from the Spirit of God in you to just take that to God with some honesty and some vulnerability, some curiosity. God, what is that? God, what would you say to that? And to just be there with that. Is there a person or a situation that comes to mind. There is no one size fits all way to handle whenever we encounter someone who is in need. This is a partnership with the Spirit of God in our lives. And so trusting that if there was a name or a person or a situation that came to mind today as you listen to the story, to just be curious with God about that. And then I also wanna acknowledge that sometimes Um, it's us. Sometimes we're the ones that need a friend, that need care, that need concern, that need wounds to be taken care of. And I don't know about you, but I have found that sometimes my own stuff is really messy and it's inconvenient and it messes with my world and I would just like to keep walking by. And so maybe for some of you, the invitation today is to invite God into your world, your disappointment, your woundedness, and to trust that Jesus, the good Samaritan in the story, meets you there. And he binds up our wounds and he heals the brokenhearted. It's understanding that that matters to God as well. So I wanna ask you to stand. We're gonna close together in a prayer today uh, by Ted Loader. And there's nothing extra special about anyone else's prayers, but the people of God have been praying prayers written by other people of God for thousands of years. And so it can be a meaningful way uh, for some of us to pause and surrender and express some gratitude. And I thought his words captured um, the heart of our story today better than any prayer I could have written or prayed over us today. And so as I pray, you are invited to close your eyes and listen. You are invited to read the words on the screen or you are invited to pray them out loud with me. So let's pray. So God, in this moment, draw me to yourself, Lord and make me aware, not so much of what I've given as of all I have received and so have yet to share. Send me forth in power and gladness and with great courage 
to live out in the world what I pray and profess, that in sharing I may do justice, make peace, grow in love, enjoy myself, other people, and your world now, and you forever. Amen.